again, lots of ultra runners tend to run on trail. But I, on, I, I say to people, right, if you're a road runner and do one ultra, do comrades. And if you're an ultra runner that runs on trails, do one road race and make it comrades. Like it is the experience. I mean, most ultras, OK, if you go to something like UTMB in Europe, they maybe have like two and a half thousand, three thousand people. In North America, most ultras maybe have 300, 400 people. You go to Comrades and there's 18,000 people running it. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. Last week, I talked to Inigo San Milan, who's done plenty of research about metabolic diseases and about exercise and about carbs and how they're not actually as bad as everyone thinks. And it was really fascinating. It was, it was very science heavy, but he explained it in a way that made sense. And it was just really fascinating. So if you've any kind of interest in nutrition or you have been wondering about this low carb, high fat thing, then maybe it is time to go check that out. But as, to, as for today, do you remember when you ran your first race? It might have been a 5K, it might have been a 10K, or maybe even you were brave and went for something a little bit longer. But at the time, the next distance up seemed almost impossible. I remember being in college and kind of thinking about doing a marathon and it just seemed like it, it just couldn't be done. And yet here I am now a marathoner. So somehow you made it through that race and then you kind of thought, well, maybe I could do the next step. Well, my guest today is one of the best ultra runners in the world. And even if you're not an ultra runner, you've probably heard of Comrades. Ellie won it in 2014 with just a few K to go. And it's quite the story. She's won Female Ultra Runner of the Year multiple times, but she doesn't just have running accomplishments to her name. You're really going to like her because she's a lovely down to earth girl. She shares her setbacks, including her year of one injury after another in 2013. And she shares us, she's just a regular girl who has bad races like the rest of us. So we'll be ready to meet Ellie in just a second after we hear from our sponsor. Running with music or podcasts distract us when there's mental demons allowed, but not when you're tangled in cords. Jabra Pulse is a wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speed. Visit jabra.com forward slash runners connect to enter to win a free Jabra Pulse every month. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Ellie. Thank you so much. I am so excited to get to talk to you. I've had, after all the ultra runners I've kind of talked to over the last few years, I've had so much about you. So I'm excited to get to know your story a little bit more, especially as you are a GB runner yourself living abroad. So you're kind of in the same situation as me. So let's start with your kind of background. Uh, You're well known as one of the greatest uh, ultra runners. And uh, I'll go into that a little bit more, but I kind of want to back backpedal a bit with the shorter distances so um did you go through the running world essentially kind of in the typical way of like cross country and athletics in England you went up through the schools or was this something you picked up later in life no it was definitely something I I picked up later in life I think which is still a bit typical of a lot of ultra runners um I ran when I was at school in the UK, like I grew up in Norfolk and sure I ran, but we did not have like, it was a track marked out on the grass, right? (laughs) Like sprayed on every summer. There was no proper track. Um, I was not particularly good. I liked all sports, like played netball, hockey. Yeah. Ran a bit of 800, but seriously, like no serious coaching, no proper stuff. It was all much more like participation and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, and I did always enjoy running. I will give it that. And then sort of probably like when I was an older teenager, I would go out and like run on my own, but just like around the streets where I lived (laughs) and, you know, absolutely no formal coaching or training. And then I really, I guess, started to, you know, very vaguely start getting into things when I was at university in York and I'd heard of the Great North Run, the half Mm -hmm. marathon. So obviously that wasn't too far away, like in terms of distance. And at that stage, I would go out and run just for fitness. So I thought, well, it'd be cool to have this goal. So I just signed off. I didn't know anyone else that was going. And I just, this will be fun. And, you know, 
dragged one of my roommates that I was living with at university out and we'd go for running and I had you know no proper gear no sports watch no nothing I don't <laughs> if you look back I have no idea like if you said how many days a week did you run I'm like I'm clueless how far did you run I have no idea no recollection so yeah when that was when I was I I think 20. I did my first half marathon. So very like recreational participant. I got uh, one hour, 59, 57. Oh, so just got, got peaked under. Just got under, but <laughs> obviously not showing any real, you know, like, wow, you're a really good runner, which is not surprising given, you know, I was <laughs> very recreational, but I really loved that. Right. So I liked the experience and I thought this was fun. Um, and then I came over to Canada after university and was living in Vancouver. And it was actually my work manager at the time who said, hey, we're doing a half marathon in a couple of weeks. Do you want to do it? Chance to n- meet some people and whatnot. And because I'd done one before, uh, OK, why not? And then that snowballed into, well, now we've done the half marathon in, I don't know, it was about four months time. We're going to do a marathon. And having grown up, you know, in the UK, watching London Marathon on the TV, I think I'm like British people, like it can be a bit of a, I don't want to say too much of a bucket list thing, but it Mm -hmm. is something that I'd seen on TV and thought that kind of looks cool, right? So there was this chance of, well, look, there's, you know, a group of people going to be training. We're training like with a local running store. And so, yeah, it was, I think I was probably 22 at the time. And did my first half mar- uh, marathon again, very recreationally. And and by then I got into okay, running was a social thing. Of I knew mm-hmm. lots of people. It was a way to get out, see places, and that kind of stuff. And it just snowballed from there. So I guess that's uh, yeah, it's probably getting on for about fourteen years ago since my first uh, marathon. And what was that first marathon? Just out of curiosity. Uh, it's uh, Victoria, which is on Vancouver Island. Oh, okay. uh, so in, yeah, so in BBC. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's a very good Canadian marathon. It's mm. one if people say, hey, is it a good first time marathon? I think it's pretty good. And what did you run? I ran three hours 25. Okay. Which, you know, so it was pretty like, good, okay, yeah. that's not bad. Again, considering that running was still you know, it's your first marathon. I was not, and I hadn't even gone through the club system of, you know, oh, what is your 10K time mm-hmm. and what's your half marathon time? It was just honestly about finishing and saying I've done a marathon mm-hmm. and doing my best on the day and isn't running fun. So yeah, it yeah. all went from there. No, no, that's interesting. And I'm glad you mentioned about seeing it on the TV because I try and explain to people, especially those listeners, which I think most people are in the US, that in Britain, in England particularly, it's uh, like no one really cares about running at all other than that one day a year. And especially having Paula around, I mean, that just was like, you know, I've always said when I, I did London last year for the first time and it was like a dream come true in every way. I even got to warm up with Paula, which was absolutely, I can't even believe that happened. But um, And, uh, you know, it's hard to explain of just how big of a deal it is for that one day only. But it's kind of cool for me hearing that 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 was kind of a uh, it it made an impression on you as well, you know, in your kind of journey. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, I think there can be two sides of it that maybe people from outside of the UK look at the London Marathon and they think, what are all these weird costumes? Like this isn't serious (laughs) running or that kind of thing. (laughs) But equally, because it's made to look like this is a lot of fun rather than this is just a bunch of people in shorts and T-shirts and it all looks very serious, it makes people who've possibly never run say, I want to do that because it's about, hey, I could do this amazing thing and maybe raise money for charity or wear a costume. And okay, that's not what I did in my first marathon, but it still, it gets you that bug that this looks like fun Mm -hmm. rather than just why on earth would you run 26 (laughs) miles? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. So then from there, uh, you ended up with a 242 PR, which, you know, you've you've said that's been over the course of 14 years. But was it from there that you kind of thought, hey, maybe if I, you know, dedicate myself, I can go after this? Or uh, was this just a very, you know, very gradual progression from there and you only recently ran that 242? Um, so my marathon, I would still say when I've been in my peak fitness, I've never really trained for a marathon. Like I've got my wow. marathon PR off the back of ultra training. 
could I get any faster at my marathon if I focused on it? Make the assumption that I would, um, because obviously when I ran that 242, I was doing very dedicated ultra running training, mm-hmm. which does in many ways translate to. Um, but no, I would say probably for the first sort of at least like five years of my running, it carried on that I would go and run with a local running store twice a week. <laughs> and it was like, OK, which relay are we doing or are we going to hop in and do this 10K or, hey, there's, you know, let's go down to Portland for the weekend and do the Portland Marathon. You know, so for a good five years or so. And I was working for a travel company. Um, which meant I spent winters in Canada and summers in uh, like various places in the Alps uh, or like Norway or Switzerland. So I was moving around and, you know, the thought of sort of serious running, you know, (laughs) didn't really enter my mind. It was just, this is fun and this is a way to see things. Um, And, but then I, it was about 10 years ago, I did, or more now probably, I did my first ultra. That was a very low key 50k. And I'd just seen it advertised in Vancouver. And it was like, it it just, I guess it got my interest, right? Of like, oh, you can run further than a marathon. Mm -hmm. Like, and this was a bit wacky and weird. And maybe that appealed to me. And it was on (laughs) Jan, it was on January 1st. So, hey, this is a way to sort of, so, um, so yeah, so I did that as the first 50k again, very much participation, go out and do it. It was a very, very, it's not even really a race, like it's just an event. Um, and then I got to know people and in, uh, I think particularly in North America, a lot of ultra runners tend to be trail ultra runners. Mm-hmm. I'd always enjoyed hiking. So then it was this like, okay, I can combine running and hiking and do trail running. Um, So then I really got into trail running and from that got into ultra trail running. Um, And definitely that was then when maybe I started winning races um, in part, I'm sure, because it was less competitive um, than say, you know, going to a road marathon. Um, But it gave me the motivation as it would anyone, right? Like you place in your age group or you come second or you win some race Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and I picked up a few smaller sponsors and that kind of thing. So that's when I really, um, like I would say probably like in about 2008 or so, I got a bit more focused on my running in terms of okay picking a target race training specifically for it really trying to do well and then and it was still very much ultra running trail running throw a marathon in here or there um and but then I think that just snowballed that I started running a lot more a lot more dedicated I started running with a running club where you know I actually started doing you know official workouts you know (laughs) going to the track or you know doing intervals in the trails and that kind of thing and so then just by default I became faster at road racing as well so So it sounds like you just, you know, you you saw that 50k, you gave it kind of gave it a try and then you just kept kind of dipping your toe in the water to see with the next level, the next distance up, I guess. And like as you had success, it just, you know, success makes you want to do it more. And so it's pretty like, uh, I guess, if typical could be a word for ultra running, I'm not sure that even exists because (laughs) ultra running seems so you know different and uh it's not really uh there's no one seems to follow a routine or regime so uh but would you say that it just kind of uh in the most natural progression that's how it happened for you yeah like it was very organic there was no plan Mm -hmm. there was no I mean and like any runner of of course you know like I don't know when I ran 130 in the half marathon you start going oh I'd like to run 125 you know of course it's that kind of thing (laughs) never happy want to progress um but yeah it was honestly when I started to you know yeah like I said win some and even if they were small races it's like okay you're winning them and that's motivation and you go well maybe I should go to a slightly more competitive Mm -hmm. trail ultra and all that kind of stuff um yeah and then I think as well like joining um you know a club which I still run with here in Vancouver the Vancouver Falcons uh where people were a bit more they're still of course having fun but a bit more dedicated training and you're just in that environment of seeing that whereas before I was running with friends who don't criticize them at all 
run mostly for fun right <laughs> and hey if we didn't quite get in the proper training for that race we'll go do it anyway and that kind of thing whereas when you start getting surrounded by other people that are much faster and chasing big goals as well I just I, I guess I learned the system a bit later than say if I'd done cross country or track mm-hmm. um like at school where and I, so I just learned it later on yeah <laughs> no that's interesting and so okay I want to talk about your successes in a minute but firstly something I wanted to ask about which kind of stood out when I was looking up some stuff about you which was um in 2013 um you had quite a lot of injuries and um you know your what, what I read about you was it was the first real experience I've ever seen about um ultra runners and injuries because I really you really don't hear much about injuries it's not like you know, um, with a marathon where the big names are, say, oh, you know, scratches this close to the race with an injury. And I, I don't know if it's just me, but I haven't really heard much about injuries. Um, do you have any, well, firstly, can you share with us what kind of happened during 2013? And then we'll maybe dig in a bit deeper. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, might is probably appropriate maybe a good learning lesson for other people to, to rewind a little bit even further. So in okay. 2012, I had it could still you know I've had two really good years 2012 was a really good year um in the extent that I raced a lot I won a lot of races and I was just on a roll Mm -hmm. and I think and don't you know if someone checks the stats and go no no you're wrong but I think I raced um about 950 kilometers that year racing yeah so I did a hundred miler. Then I would like four weeks later, right, I'm going to do a 50 miler. Four and I weeks was later? Yeah. So and I was racing them <laughs> and I could do it. Right. And I will admit, of course, for sure, there was, you know, some races that were more competitive than others and others were more like, hey, that will be fun. But I did an awful lot of racing yeah. and I had a blast and I do not regret it at all. But then we came into 2013 and of course, but in early 2013, hey, I'm feeling fine and, you know, I'm just carrying on and why shouldn't I have another year like last year? Um, So, yeah, so it was early on in the year I started having what I thought was ankle pain and I was seeing various uh, like physical therapists and getting it checked out and what is this and what isn't it? And I was still able to run, but it was kind of getting worse and it wasn't going away. And this was probably probably over the course of maybe not ridiculous length of time, but maybe like six or eight weeks. Um, But it was definitely getting worse. And I was trying to train for comrades in South Mm -hmm. Africa, which is always at like very end of May or start of June. Um, But by the start of May, when I was going to do Vancouver Marathon kind of as training run, I had to drop out of that. And then like it was about a week later, I found out I had a stress fracture uh, in my fibula. So obviously that was, OK, comrades off the cards, you know, mm-hmm. like th- this is an injury where you can't say, well, you know, maybe if you take a few yeah. weeks. Like there's, there's a tried and tested. Mm-hmm. If you have a stress fracture, you've got to take X amount of time off. Then you're going to have to build up slowly. Yeah. Like there's no there's no way around it. Right. It's not like, well, you could be lucky and it heals quickly. No. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So, yeah, so the stress fracture was one thing. Um, I was, you know, as you have to be, you know, I think only someone who really hasn't got it is going to try and run on a stress fracture. So I did my time of pool running, cross training, you know, trying to do all that sort of thing. Um, And then I eased my way back in the summer. um, And then I just had I just had little small things. So the stress fracture never came back. You know, there was times where I was like, oh, am I feeling something? I'm not sure. But again, I had to get very good physio that I would see and a sports med doctor that would give me advice. So I knew I wasn't like launching back into things too quickly. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, the human body, there aren't hard and fast rules. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that was an up and down year. And I don't think I didn't actually race an ultra at all that year or possibly one I'm not sure um but yeah and I managed you know from having been found out had the stress fracture at say like uh, early May then by I think it was September I ran a, like a, a low key it was actually in the UK the Moray Marathon um up in Elgin in Scotland mm-hmm. um and I ran I think it was like a 252 but it was like <laughs> well, so, not bad. I got no and I'd got back to the shape of 
I can actually run a marathon, mm-hmm. right? And at that point, so between May and September, it was just pleased that, hey, I can run a marathon. And I knew I wasn't super fit, but it was like, I just want to do it and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that was 2013 of little niggling things after the stress fracture. So yeah. so then you said that you wouldn't, you you don't regret it and you don't regret anything you did in 2012. So what would you have changed if you could go back? Or would you not have changed anything? I don't honestly know I would. I think the only thing I might change, I mean, don't get me wrong, I would not race that much again now. I don't think I could. (laughs) Um, Like, I look back and I'm like, how did I, apart from anything, just have, like, the energy and and feel Mm -hmm. able to race that much? I think probably the only thing I might have changed is, uh, like, really having a break at the end of the year. Right. I've gone, Okay. look, at some point, um, I can't remember when my last race was that year. Actually, it was November and it was a 50 miler. Um, So I think I would have said, look, you've got to pull the plug and really like maybe spend four, even like six weeks of very, very minimal running, you know, like really have downtime. Whereas I felt fine. So why would I stop running? Yeah, it's hard to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to do that. And no one, again, I can't blame other people, but no one at that point, and now I've learned more, that look, you really need to have a period in the year where you just like absolutely back off. So had I done that, would it have helped? Who who knows? But I certainly think it uh, it might have done. So, so how yeah. would you like to kind of give that as advice to someone listening right now who may be in a stage, you know, maybe they started running within the last few years and they're at that point where everything's kind of clicking together. You know, they've built up the base, they've built the training, they've had the good workouts and they're just clicking off good races. And, you know, it can be tempting, like you said, like, why would you want to stop and throw away your fitness essentially and well that's what we think in our minds by taking that time off what would you like to tell anyone be an ultra runner or or even a shorter distance runner um do yeah you do have to be you have to pick and choose right so if I think if you want to do which is the typical ultra runner often mindset I say like we're not just ultra runners we like to run far we like to run lots of races right But maybe pick and choose, um, particularly if you want to start looking at performance, right? Like I was racing races hard. I wasn't Mm -hmm. just, and I have no criticism to people that say, I want to do a race because it's in a cool location. I get the experience my friends are going. I think that can be a little different. But if you start feeling, hey, I want to get a 50 mile like PR or I want to improve my race time from last year then you're now looking at performance and then you might have to sacrifice some other races to just focus on those others and also yeah then maybe you know rest time after races rather than just going right on to the next one um yeah and definitely you know it's difficult like even in the ultra world now there's races all year round right Mm -hmm. so whereas our bodies don't know that the calendar goes from like January to December so you can't just on January 1st go okay it's a new year off we go again (laughs) okay well wait a minute you did in like October November December yeah all this kind of stuff so yeah particularly if you're going to do an early season race do you have to take you know sacrifice a race that you might have wanted to do at the end of the previous year that kind of thing so definitely yeah I'd say I would, I mean, I would no way do that number of races again, but Mm -hmm. I had fun whilst I was doing it. (laughs) And that's always good. And you probably learned a lot about who you are in that, in those hours cross training and during that time. So probably was good for you in the long run. And then, so then my original kind of question, um, you don't really hear much about injuries, uh, within ultra running. Um, do you have any thoughts on why that is, or like, is it, uh, you know, in my logical mind, I would think you're running further, you know, you're pounding your body so hard um, with the, you know, just that duration of time on your feet. So w- surely there should be more injuries, but it seems like, I mean, I hear less of that. Yeah, I think there's a fair number of injuries in ultra <laughs> running, whether it's more than, say, like traditional you know, marathon or shorter road racing and track racing. I'm not sure. I think one of the things with ultra running, again, slightly 
you know, North American focused, a lot of it is on trail, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a variety of load on the body, right? Of you're, do, you're doing uphill stuff, then you're going downhill, you're on flat, you're on softer surfaces, right? So there's a lot of that, which can in some ways, I think, be easier on the body, right? Because you just don't get the hard pounding. Um, of course, you then get the different stress of, okay, you're maybe bombing down a mountain trail. Rolling that's your ankle, no yeah. Hard, and rolling <laughs> your ankle, but that's a little different, I think. Then, um, by and large, it's slower paced running. Mm-hmm. So there's a different stress of, okay, let's, for example, I don't know, you've spent 10 hours running, Mm -hmm. but you're going at a much lower intensity than if you're trying to run, I don't know, a 245 marathon on the road, right? If you're Mm -hmm. doing a 50 mile trail race and it takes you 10 hours. So it's a different kind of stress, Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it depends what, I don't, you know, what kind of level of runner you look at. Um, A lot of ultra runners, just like running and I think it's changing a little bit but are maybe less inclined to say go and do track workouts go and bang out tempo runs on the road and I think those are the sort of runs that sure you get real fitness benefits from Mm -hmm. them but it's maybe more strain on your body whereas a more recreational ultra runner might go out for a four-hour run at the weekend but they're hiking a bit Mm -hmm. they're on trails they're chatting away for you know a good chunk of the thing uh, of the run and so it's uh yeah it's lower impact Mm -hmm. that that makes sense so then what would what would a workout like if you were going to prepare for like say you're preparing for comrades and what would be a a workout that you would do like you know you you mentioned for a marathon it might be a tempo run and you might do some mile reps or something like what would you do for ultra running or for the obviously different distances matter but yeah I mean I would still do that kind of training for something like comrades right um because ultimately uh comrades is a road race and it is therefore and obviously you know I'm hoping to be fairly near the front of the pack and so you've got to be fast Mm -hmm. so I'm still doing tempo runs I'm I don't honestly really do track workouts, mm-hmm. um, but I do a lot of longer intervals, like maybe 3K, 2K, 1K intervals, but I will do them on trail. Some of those trails will be flat. Some of them will be rolling. And definitely I'm more inclined to put in sort of like a hilly tempo run. So not just going out and doing a tempo run, but more like tempo intensity but having lots of hills in there again because comrades is a hilly course okay. so and so work a bit more on strength and yeah. endurance even within the balance of yeah you've got to have a bit of speed in there mm-hmm. so, and how many yeah. like miles of hard effort would you do in something like that uh it depends like sorry and I'm very Canadian <laughs> kilometers. Oh, kilometers yeah you can do kilometers that's you fine something like if it was a tempo or an interval session, like maybe something like 10 to 15 miles. Okay. Um, if it was uh, shorter intervals with rest in between, then maybe round about, and I'm having to go here, yeah, about uh, seven kilometres, so about four yeah. and a half, like five miles-ish, like that kind of okay. Okay. part of it. Yeah, hmm. yeah. But I don't, by and large, I will admit, and this is maybe also still a bit of my history, like, for example, go to the track and, like, do 200 or anything like that so. <laughs> no I don't like those either <laughs> 200 is no thanks <laughs> okay cool uh, this is really interesting all right so you have you know ha- like I mentioned earlier you've had so much success you've been world champion you've competed in comrades three times I think is that correct three times uh four times four times and you've yeah. won it once in 2014 what? which, uh, you know, that's uh, for those who don't know, it's possibly the best known, most competitive uh, ultra race there is, which is, you know, uh, almost every ultra runner is going to strive for that one. So can you kind of share the experience of that one, especially as you were the first like British athlete ever to win and just what, what it was like kind of winning that one? Yeah, OK. Um, I mean, Comrades is amazing just because of like the history of the event. So when you say, for example, I'm the first British person to have won it, one of the amazing little sort of side stories is at the finish line, like one night one, you go into this like VIP area and there's all these past winners. And um, 
like people are coming up to me and there's br- like British men who now live in South Africa and a few of them were Scottish and I'm like born in Dundee mm-hmm. and they're like I won in like 1959 <sighs> and there's all these people so and that is just like an example so I'm the first British woman to woman. have won it okay. right. uh, but it's absolutely amazing like it's more than 90 years old um again Lots of ultra runners tend to run on trail, but I, on, I, I say to people, right, if you're a road runner and do one ultra, do comrades. And if you're an ultra runner that runs on trails, do one road race and make it comrades. <sighs> like it is the experience. I mean, most ultras, okay, if you go to something like UTMB in Europe, they maybe have like two and a half thousand, three thousand people. In North America, most ultras maybe have 300, 400 people. You go to comrades and there's 18,000 people running Whoa, it. Oh, I didn't realise it was that big. Yeah, so it's it's big. And again, I say it's rather like the London Marathon of you get people, South Africans, who are not really runners, <laughs> and yet they say, no, I'm going to do the comrades one year. Um, so before I'd won it, I well, the first time I ran it, I came fourth, uh, absolutely loved it, thought, yeah, I just just want to go back because this is an amazing race 12 um and came second um now the course alternates direction it's a point to point course um so one year it is net uphill from Durban to Peter Maritzburg and the next year it's net downhill Mm. um I'm definitely a much stronger downhill runner and there is you know like there's each direction people have got their preference or what they feel they're better at and I'm definitely a downhill runner and it is significant downhill like uh it's about it's a bit short of 90 kilometers uh so about 55 miles and it's got 2,000 meters of downhill um but still has 1,400 metres of uphill on a down year, uh, which are what I always remind people, like you're not just freewheeling the whole way. Um, But yeah, so I'd come second in 2012, uh, obviously, and it was pretty close to first. Um, Like it was just over a minute. So I thought, well, uh, and that that was quite, I don't want to say a surprise, but it was like, okay, I could win this Mm because I thought, I can get that much faster. Like, it's not like, well, that person was 20 minutes ahead and I'm just not that fast a runner. Um, And of course, 2013, the stress fracture happened, went out the window, didn't happen. So 2014, I went back. Did I have the aim to win? Yeah, for sure. But I I think like any competitive runner, you go into this race with respect that there's, I mean, there's the Nergaleva twins from Russia who won something like 11 of the past, 12 years mm. um including Elaine and Ergaleva she'd won it like eight times wow. and so if you're lining up against people you're thinking like they know how to run this race mm-hmm. like really run this race but I thought I've come second so you know it's doable honestly people say wow that was an amazing race I said it was absolutely horrendous race <laughs> I had a terrible time um I really struggled um but as and again this is the thing in ultra races and I think even in marathoning right you just have to work through the rough spots right and unless there's a real reason to drop out like you know you're really injured or you're doing yourself damage right and a race like Comrades, you know, I've flown all the way, like, from Canada to South Africa. I'm not going to give up, right? And it's very much because you still have that sort of London Marathon sense of, you know, people that it's their biggest achievement just to finish it. You know, or even my, you know, I went in going, I would love to win this. But I thought, uh, I'm making it to the finish line. Like, I, I don't care how badly this goes. And particularly because I'd had the stress fracture the year before. Mm-hmm not being able to run it I thought I have not done all this training all this rehab so no I mean I was having uh you know pretty rough time and walking sections if I had to and just I don't know like whether it was my head wasn't in the right space and I couldn't quite click in but yeah I rode through those rough sections and just carried on moving carried on running and you know got was getting closer to the finish and you start getting feedback because there's you know crowds all along the way like cheering and whatnot and people started saying like you're catching them you're catching them and I thought yeah okay but you know they must be miles ahead and I'm running out of terrain but yeah indeed it was about uh three kilometers about two miles from the finish that I took the lead a 55 mile race uh so it was a little nail biting it was a little surprising um and yeah then I was just 
you know, I, I, you know, I will put it out there. I would love to win Comrades again. But when I was in that position, I thought this might be my one and only chance. And it's the one race I really, really want to win. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah. So I, how uh, did it feel after having that, you know, really struggling, having a bad race um, when you did, you know, see them, the leaders like come into view? Was it kind of like uh, it would be in a shorter race where it was like blood in the water kind of thing and you like, you know, mowed them down pretty quickly? Or was this just kind of like, you know, uh, to what you were at that point where it, there isn't any kind of mowing people down. It's just you gradually were creeping in. No, it's yeah. And it's quite interesting because um, like I was in third place and then within the space of I don't know, I, I mean, I should know but within the space of two or three minutes I was in first place wow so you did so and the thing is although you're getting these shouts from the crowds as any road racer know you take any you know information you get from the sidelines with a bit of pinch of salt of like yeah yeah well they're not really looking at their watch and like how accurate is this um but no I think uh, I mean and the the two twins the Nogaleva sisters were slowing down but even so, I mean, like I said, I overtook them. I think it was about three kilometres to go. And I ended up winning by more than five minutes. Wow. Um, but it's rather interesting because um, of like how the pacing works in a race like that. Obviously, I'd struggled a lot before. So I then had this real like finishing kick. So in the last seven kilometres, like I ended up about 50th overall, um, like amongst the men and mm-hmm. everything. But then the last seven kilometres, only one man ran faster than me. (laughs) So it was definitely I had a finishing kick. But then it was the same last year when a South African woman won, uh, Caroline Vostman. Over the last seven kilometres, no men ran faster than her. So I think it also goes to show, you know, it's a kind of race, um, you know, even in an ultra you do have to be patient mm-hmm. in some extent, right? Um, but also, you do also have to have that bit of speed as well. Like, if you really want to be at the front of a race like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I found yeah. it funny just then that you said you had a kick over the last 7K, which, <laughs> if you say that to anyone, <laughs> marathon and under, that just sounds hilarious. But I see what you're saying. It's just it, funny. It's relative to the <laughs> If you said, well, how fast you were running, you're like, that's not really a finishing kick. But <laughs> proportional speed. Yes, I see what you're saying. It is. It's like everything stretched out, right? Mm-hmm. You know, of marathon, you know, and it's like a 10K runner talking to a marathoner, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, that's funny. And, okay, here's a question. Um, I've always said that my injuries, I'm glad they happened. Um, would you say that had you not gone through that really rough year in 2013, do you think you still would have pulled that off? Or do you think uh, ha- having been through that, it kind of gave you an extra gear to kind of dig, dig down and hold on through those rough patches? Yeah, for sure. And I think as well, I came into 2014 a bit like, OK, I'm, I'm not saying when I ran Comrades before I wasn't focused, but I had all these other races going on as well. whereas. But Comrades was the one I absolutely loved. Mm-hmm. And so because that was the one race because I really couldn't run it in 2013. That was the real disappointment. I mean, sure, there was other races, for example, Western States 100 Miler. I was super disappointed to not run that. But there was other races that I didn't do in 2013 that I'm not saying I just went, oh, well, doesn't matter. But it didn't mean as much mm-hmm. to miss out of them. So I think because I was injured, then I came into 2014 with a okay, I really want to do Comrades because I couldn't do it last Mm -hmm. year. It's also interesting as well, like I said, the up and the down years are a bit different. I'm more of a down year runner. So I'd come second in a down year. Had I gone back in 2013 on an up year, I might have come fifth or something. Mm -hmm. And then I might have thought, oh, come on, don't be, you know, silly, Mm. you can't come first. Whereas I I almost went back with that memory of the last time I was here, I was quite close to, you know, possibly winning. So maybe that would have helped, Mm. who knows. Just go through, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens, no, and it definitely made me more focused Mm -hmm. on choosing which races am I really going to be ready for. Yeah, that's great. Okay, cool. All right, so then let's uh, change on to something different now, talking about fueling. 
Um, you are a vegetarian, or at least you were the last I checked. Um, and so do you want to kind of talk about fueling a bit more? You know, maybe you can talk about your races, but also just in general, because I'm sure anyone listening who thinks, you know, vegetarian ultra runner, how the heck do you get enough calories in? So maybe talk about both of those. Um, yeah, for sure. So there's a lot of vegetarian ultra runners <laughs> and there's even vegan ultra runners. Um, I might put off any veg- any ultra runners listening to this. I think ultra runners are the sort of people that get very attached to, they have to say they're on a particular diet. They can't just be, I eat, you know, a balanced, healthy diet. It's like, oh, I'm on, you know, like <laughs> the high fat, the low carb. I'm on this diet. I'm on that diet. I'm honestly vegetarian for like environmental yes. and ethical reasons. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nothing to do with my running. But I don't feel it's a detriment to my running either. But I have been like I've been a vegetarian since I was about 17. Um, So I'm very used to it. It wasn't something I decided to do for performance reasons. Uh, But like I said, I've never had anything, you know, that's indicated that, well, really, if if you ate some red meat or some fish like once Mm -hmm. a week, you would be, in a sense, healthier and able to run better, right? Um, So that's the proviso I do put in. Um, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not an expert, but I just eat. And I know some meat eaters might, you know, not agree with this, but a balanced vegetarian diet, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't believe you need to have ridiculous amounts of protein and you can get far enough. I think it's much harder when you start being vegan. And I'm not saying you can't be vegan because, again, you know, there's people like Scott Jurek, who Mm -hmm. obviously are amazing runners on a vegan diet. But I think you really have to know what you're doing. Whereas you can get plenty of protein from, you know, eggs, from nuts, from lentils, pulses, beans, you know, everything like that. Um, And I honestly... Yeah, I don't struggle. Like it's uh, it's almost a non-issue. I think being vegetarian, um, and then more coming into yeah, like fueling for races. Again, this is where I think some people think ultra runners are. Uh, I don't know, slightly odd because you can come <laughs> up to some of these like aid stations and races. And I mean, compared to a marathon where it's like, okay, here's some cups of Gatorade and some water <laughs> and maybe an energy gel. And in an ultra, there's like, hey, do you want some pretzels? Do you want some M&Ms? And oh, we've got a peanut butter sandwich here if you want. And they have horses, <laughs> right? Um, again, it depends on what kind of racing and what you're doing, right? Like, if, for example, you know, if I go to something like Western States 100 miler, which took me, well, you know, 17 to 18 hours, um, in that I am still predominantly having stuff like energy drinks, gels, you know, sports chews, like I'm sponsored by Cliff. So I'm still predominantly taking those. Um, but I will also sometimes be having stuff like watermelons or people always laugh at me I'm well known for my salt and vinegar uh, crisps (laughs) or chips as we call them over here which are apparently very British but that's what I like Um, so you know something tastes a bit savory it's got a bit of fat in it but again it's high calorie it's easy to get down Um, and then in the later stages of say an ultra like that I would be probably having something like coke because again it's got salt it's got sugar it's got caffeine and it's high calorie Mm -hmm. so it works. Now, if if I was um, doing a much slower and less runnable, you know, race in something like Western States, sure, I might start having a sandwich or that kind of thing. But then you go to something like World 100K or Comrades, and I'm 100% on gels and energy drinks, and that mm. keeps me going. And you do have to have the stomach for it. Like, I know some people yeah. just know it's too much processed sugar maybe it's not good that I can tolerate that I don't know what it shows about my general diet um but if you can have it just on the basis of it's a very measured amount if you have a gel you know how many calories you have had whereas if you start you know dipping into the oh I'm having a piece of this and a little bit of that um I think it gets a little bit harder, um, you know, to plan. And obviously, again, you will laugh being, you know, maybe not so much an ultra runner, but, you know, at a faster paced ultra, like World 100K, you need to have something that's not jostling in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm in a 50 mile trail race that involves, you know, hiking up a mountainside and I'm going at a, 
you know, a 20 minute kilometre, not a 20 minute mile, but 20 minute kilometre, then for sure you can have something like chips, pretzels or an energy bar, right? Like something a bit more solid because your stomach isn't like jostling up and down quite as much. So, uh. huh. And then do you have a certain number of calories you try and get per hour? Yes. Um, but it depends on the race? It, it, dep- it depends on the race. Um, I mean, I would say... It, at least 200 but okay. hopefully more so okay. hopefully a gel every half hour um and but then I'm also one like and again this depends on what people's stomach I'm one for I say always putting calories in your drink right now some people are just like oh no I need plain water but the nice thing is if even if I have like quite a dilute energy drink I think well that's a few extra calories that Mm -hmm. I'm getting in without even thinking about it and you know if it is something like comrades which you know it's I mean, it isn't an African winter, but it's still fairly warm, right? You know, it's like, you know, 20 to 25 degrees maybe towards the end. Then obviously you're needing to take on liquids. So I always think, well, it's a bit of a bonus if you can get some calories in those liquids as well. So. Huh. Okay, good. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Um, all right. So this is probably going to go live um, beginning of May. So I don't know if you would have raced between now and then, but what kind of races do you have coming up in the second half of the year? I'm guessing Comrades is one of them. But um, what do you, yeah? What are you? What's planned for the rest of the year? Plan for the rest of the year. Yeah. So Comrades for sure, which is at end of May. Um, so that is you know the focus of my training now. I've got a couple of races that I'm doing in the lead up to that, but very much as a, you know, preparation. And it, again, it sounds a bit silly, but as an ultra runner, if you have to go for a 50k training run, why not? If you can go to mm-hmm. a race, yeah, and just, you know, like get it done and have a bit of fun. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll do comrades. Um, I'm then going to do a couple of uh, local races here in Canada. There's one called the Nienacker in North Vancouver um, and one called uh, Broken Goat, which is in Rosland in British Columbia. So they're 50k okay. races. They're trail. They're not, I mean, they're trail slash mountain. So they're, pre- they're a bit more technical, more elevation, gain and loss, nice mountain views. And those will really be a bit of a fun, like it's nice, it's summer, you want to get out on that stuff um, while I can. And then after that, in August, I hope to do uh, Ultravarsen, which is in Sweden. It's a 90 kilometer race, which is one I've not done before. It's a uh, pretty flat and fast in ultra terms um but it is on trail so that sounds absolutely super um it's in the hometown of uh, jonas Boot, who won world 100k last year um so very well organized super event and then i will be going back in october to les templiers in france which i ran in 2015 um that's a 75k race um, in uh, the sort of southwestish area of France, um, and th- that's a mix. It's got fast sections. It's got some, you know, a bit more technical trail, a bit of fun, um, and yeah. So those are the main plans for the moment. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds like you've got a packed calendar, but not too packed as as was two, 2012. Yeah. <laughs> so then, what's the best way for people to follow along with what you're doing? From now on, is there a- um, the best way if they want to, I'm quite often on Twitter, so that's uh, okay. Ellie J G on Twitter, um, or I've got my athlete page on Facebook, which is uh, just go on Facebook and you can search well either Ellie Greenwood or it's Ultra Ellie on Facebook. Okay, all right, and I will put links to those in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash one zero five. Some days we need all the motivation we can get to make sure we finish our workout or make it through that cross-training session, especially when we're trapped indoors. It has been well documented that running with music or a motivating podcast can help improve performance. But as much as I love the idea, I found myself getting frustrated with the cords getting in my way, or when they would rip out of the treadmill. Finally, I have a solution. Jabra Pulse is the sweat-proof, weather-proof, wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speeds. Even better, it has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor that quickly connects to your phone so you can ditch the chest strap. The earbuds will have a secure and comfortable fit thanks to the ability to customise the earpieces. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runnersconnect. 
That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or by the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. So I just have the final kick round left for you, Ellie. So uh, starting with greatest advice you've ever received. Yeah, this was a tough question, which I, <laughs> I honestly don't really have an answer for it. But uh, yeah, I think the, the people that I look for, for advice are the people that are smart but the people that also just uh, sometimes throw caution to the wind and go, do you know what, I'm going to go for a super big goal and believe in those goals. Oh, love that. Believe in that. That's cool. Yeah, that's good. I would say that's definitely good. Okay, favourite running book or blog? So, the, yeah, this is a hard one because, again, there's lots of different books out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to say the last one that I read, but it is something. So it's um, How Bad Do You Want It by Matt Oh, Sparrow, yes, I have that book. Which yep. I really like, like, I like the sort of psychology and mind games of running and, you know, and how Mm -hmm. that can help. So, of course, I've read, you know, there's lots of inspirational biographies and whatnot by ultra runners. And those are amazing books. But I like that idea. I enjoy in ultra running the the mindset side of yeah. as well so, oh, oh yeah that was an awesome read and entertaining as well right with yeah, lots, of, yeah, lots of stories rather than you know this is just you know the psychology kind of side of things oh yeah yeah, yeah we're I, I loved that book and uh, we're huge fans of Matt Fitzgerald here I've had him on the podcast three times actually oh, so, so yeah he's 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 a big we're, we're big Matt Fitzgerald fans <laughs> yeah it's one I can like read again and dip in and out of yeah you know, like read it before a race yeah. and get you fired up yeah yeah definitely yeah okay so what would you tell us? new runner um I honestly say to new runners run with other people right good um like whether it's in North America it's popular you know running stores have groups to run with or you know elsewhere like join your local running club don't be afraid to be like oh I'm a new runner and I'm not really a runner so I can't go with them like runners are super friendly and you know yes there are awesome books out there but you learn way way more by running with other people and just chatting mm-hmm. as you're running along. Yeah. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Okay, favorite um pre-race meal? Oh, I'm very boring. I mean, this is so <laughs> okay, if if it's going to be breakfast, I have a like uh toast and peanut butter or oatmeal with a bit of honey and banana, right? Like nothing mm-hmm. very it's exciting. Safe. Something very safe, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think I, I'm the same way. And a, cup so. tea, and a cup of tea as well. I have to <laughs> Got to do that. British British. Thing and have a cup of tea for a race. <laughs> <laughs> We're both keeping our heritage one exactly. way or another, even though we've abandoned the country itself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and finally, favourite running product? This will seem weird coming from a sponsored runner because, of course, I love gear. I think gear yeah. is awesome. But particularly again ultra runners we get so obsessed by like oh, what hydration pack are you wearing what jacket have you got oh I need this pair of shoes for that and that pair of shoes for that so firstly I do say to beginners as well it's not about the gear it's about getting out and like enjoying the experience Mm -hmm. that said you've asked me what's my favorite thing um I do love the uh like the Salomon hydration vests Uh, Mm um like they've got the three liter and the five liter um yeah and they are good because I find I use mine like, you know, I'm running down to meet my running club and I throw in an extra change of clothes. So it's not just like, oh, an ultra runner and you've got to carry, you know, like two litres of water and lots of food. So mm-hmm. that's something I find that I use every day. So I think that's a, yeah. a good investment piece to have is one of those. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Well, um, Ellie, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed getting to know you more. And I'm sure everyone else has. And uh I'm sure a lot of our ultra runners are very jealous that I've talked to you today. So thank you for your time. No, thank you for the opportunity. Have you noticed it seems to be a common theme with our guests? Everyone has those struggles, but it's all about how you keep moving forward, just putting one foot in front of the other during those tough moments. We wish Ellie all the luck in her goal of winning comrades later this year. And remember what she said, if you only do one ultra in your life, it should be that one. Remember, this is the last week you can enter to be one of five winners of Brad's book, You Can Run Pain-Free. There will be a link to the contest on the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC105. Next week, we're going to be talking to the founder of Nerd Fitness, Steve Cam. Steve is a fun character who convinced me and will convince you that every one of us can be our own superhero. 
If you need to build your confidence, this will do it. Until then, have a great week.